Good afternoon. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules on this, this home start of homecoming weekend to come here and hear what I think is going to be a real treat this afternoon. Um, I'm the new dean of the Z. Smith Reynolds Library, Tim Pyatt, and I think this was scheduled specifically for me so I could learn more about Wake Forest, so I really appreciate that. Um, so uh, I'm, uh, I, I sort of learned shortly after I arrived here at, at Wake Forest that um, someone came up to me and told me that the greatest treasure in the university was housed right here in the library. So I immediately thought, I see Tanya back there, which must be on the sixth floor in the Special Collections Library. That's got to be where all the treasures are. And they said, no, it's on the fourth floor. And it's not a thing, it's a person. It's Dr. Ed Wilson. And so I've gotten to meet him and know him, and, I'm I, and I'm, as I hear more, I certainly have found out this is definitely true. So um, for most of you, he may not be someone who needs an introduction, but I'm going to give you one anyway. So um, uh, Edwin Grays Wilson is known to many as Mr. Wake Forest, and he spent his entire adult life, with the exception of wartime and graduate school, here at Wake Forest. Uh, he first came to the university at the age of 16 and graduated summa cum laude in 1943. After serving in the Navy for three years, uh, Dr. Wilson returned to Wake Forest to teach English for a year before going to Harvard to get his Ph.D. Uh, in 1952 in English. He returned to North Carolina to join the Wake Forest faculty and has the distinction of actually working on both Wake Forest campuses. Pretty impressive. Um, at the, his time in Wake Forest, Dr. Wilson has served as English professor, dean of the college, the university's first provost, senior vice president, and now provost emeritus. He helped found the Babcock uh, Graduate School of Management in 1970 and was instrumental in the university's addition of study abroad programs in Venice and London. In retirement, he remains amazingly active, at times teaching and as continually assisting his alma mater, inclu including writing the History of Wake Forest, Volume 5. He's an expert on romantic poetry and the poetry of William Butler Yeats and Dylan Thomas, and he's renowned for his passionate uh, recitations of poetry. Dr. Wilson embodies the ideals, the values, and spirit of Wake Forest, has ins been inspirational to a generation of students, faculty, and alumni. Uh, Dr. Wilson has received numerous honors, including the Wake Forest Medallion of Merit, the John Tyler Caldwell Award for the Humanities, and the North Carolina Award for Public Service. And for those of us who work here in the library, we're inspired daily. You know, the other day I just was walking by the um, Starbucks. He's in there talking with students. You know, I just always see, I'm surprised you ever get to your office. I think you get waylaid. I, I've even done it myself, uh, waylaid by everyone who just wants to have a chance to talk with you. And so um, it's really a privilege to have him here and it, well, really to see him sort of literally opening doors for uh, all the people of the Wake Forest community. So now without further ado to our program, we had a fun program for you. Um, we're really thrilled to have you here, and there's some prepared questions that have been scattered among the audience. And so what I'm going to do, uh, we're going to have uh, about 45 minutes of uh, questions, and then I'll sort of cut it off that time and then give at least, say, 15 minutes for just general questions from the audience. So um, we'll let Dr. Wilson come up. So who has question number one? All right. Thank you. Before anyone asks a question, I'd like to thank Tim and I would also like to say how happy we at Wake Forest are to welcome Tim Pyatt as the new Dean of the Library. Um, yes? If you were not known as Mr. Wake Forest, what would you like to be known for? <laughs> oh. I think as a devoted husband, a loving father, and a loving grandfather would be the things that I would be most happy about in my life. I have been very fortunate in that I married and have stayed with a young woman whom I met in front of the library about 51 years ago and from our union have come delightful boys and girls, and they are more important than any kind of title that anyone can have, but thank you. Question two, all right. Um, hi, my name is Tina Miller-Tran, and I'm a junior, and to begin, my English professor last year was Dr. Elizabeth Way. And when I asked her what influenced her to pursue teaching in English, I will not forget her answer. She said that it was the impact that Dr. Wilson had on her. Yeah. So I'd like to thank you for the impact you've had on my professor and this campus and community. My question for you today is, what is it about British literature that attracts you more than, say, nonfiction? The question is, what, it, what is it that attracts me about British literature? 
I don't know how many of you had the experience that I had when I was a young man in high school and college. I began to read, and for reasons that I can't quite explain, I especially like to read novels by English men and English women, beginning with Sir Walter Scott, who perhaps is not read as widely as he ought to be, and continuing with Charles Dickens and Emily and Charlotte Bronte and George Eliot. It was the English authors that drew me especially. And for reasons that are probably very subterranean, I preferred them to James Fenimore Cooper and Nathaniel Hawthorne. The English writers drew me to them. And also, from early years, I was captivated by the stories of King Arthur and his knights and their search for the Holy Grail. And early on, I read Tennyson's Idols of the King, which took hold of me. And I must say, I've been looking for the Holy Grail ever since. <laughs> so I was an Anglophile from an early stage. And when I went to graduate school, I took a marvelous two-semester course under a man named Hyder Rollins, who was one of the great scholars of his generation. And he taught romantic poetry. And since I was already a romantic and already an Anglophile, I was drawn to what I think is the purest expression of literary form that is to poetry. And so, about 1952, I became addicted to poetry, and especially to romantic poetry. And I must say that nothing that has happened since then has reduced my opinion that in romantic poetry, you find some of the clearest and most beautiful expressions of life that you can discover anywhere. Wordsworth, Coleridge, Keats, Shelley, and later on, William Butler Yeats, especially. All right, next question. I have a slight hearing problem, so I have to listen okay. very carefully. Um, hi. What is a campus event or tradition that you hold most dear? What is what? A campus event or tradition that you hold a most dear. You mean a, a continuing campus event? Or an or old one. Or a specific one. event. Either one. It's up to you. Right. <laughs> well, I think my love of Wake Forest began with one event, one habit, that I hope continues to be widespread. When I went to Wake Forest a long time ago, I had never been away a single night from home. I was 16 years old. On a few occasions, I had been with my family somewhere but I had never spent a night away from my mother and father and brothers and sisters. And you can imagine how naive I was. What was it going to be like to be in this strange place? Would I be homesick? Would I be lonely? Would I be unhappy? That first night on the old campus, which by the way I hope every one of you will visit Someday it's worth a visit. That first night I walked from my room over to the chapel for the first night of orientation. And I discovered something that I had not known before. 
Wherever I went, people greeted me with kindness, with enthusiasm. Students, faculty, everybody. So I made this walk of about three blocks, and all along the way, people said hello, wished me well, and even some older people who were clearly faculty members <laughs> stopped me and said words of welcome and hoped that I would be happy at Wake Forest. And I've been happy at Wake Forest ever since. <laughs> and there is nothing that makes Wake Forest any more what it should be than our getting to know each other and to speak to each other and to be part of a loving community. And that's what I treasure most. Hi. Okay, so my question is, are there any aspects that you miss from old campus that didn't make it to Winston-Salem? What? I'm sorry. Sorry, are there any aspects from old campus, um, either buildings or other things that that I miss that you miss from okay. old campus? You people don't know what the old campus was like, but let me tell you one thing about it. In the 40s, when I was a student, hardly anyone had an automobile. I knew one boy from Elizabeth City who I think must have been quite rich, and he had a car, but nobody else much had a car. I'm not sure that faculty members <laughs> always had cars. And this meant that wherever we went, unless we left town, and when we left town we usually hitchhiked, wherever we went, we walked. I was talking not long ago with Rogan Kirsch, our new provost, who was telling me about our fitness program that we're going to expand at Wake Forest in that new building next to the Reynolds Gymnasium. And I believe in fitness programs. But then we didn't have to have a fitness program <laughs> because we walked everywhere. And to a certain extent, we stayed fit in that way. And one of the good things about that environment was that we were always here and there on our own. And the other thing I miss is that Old Wake Forest was in a little town. And every place we needed to go was in that little town. There were two movie houses in that little town. There was a soda shop. There were restaurants. There were drug stores. And they were all within walking distance. It would be as if now you went over to Polo Road, and there'd be a movie, a drugstore, a restaurant, a cafeteria, all lined up there. So the town of Wake Forest and the college of Wake Forest were completely tied together. And there was something very appealing about that, I thought. number five. Oh. <laughs> oh. If you could say one thing to all current Wake Forest students, what would you say? If I could say one thing to all current Wake Forest students, what would I say? Hmm. I think sometimes in college, students think too much about the future, 
too much about what's going to happen after college. Too much about what they're going to do after college. As if somehow college is a preparation for life. I would say to them, don't think of college as a preparation for life. Think of college as life. What you do between 18 and 22, you will find, will be among the best things you will ever do. And don't dwell so much about what kind of job you're going to have, how much money you're going to make, What's going to occur to you when you're 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80? <laughs> Think about this being life and savor every, every day of it. Don't be future oriented. Live in the present. He's got number six. Does anyone have question six? Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Dr. Wilson, what was it like to know Maya Angelou, and what were some of your favorite memories with her? I don't know how many of you had an opportunity to know Maya Angelou. There has been no one like her in Wake Forest, I guess, in its history. I had a chance to get to know her soon after she came, which I think was about 1982. And frankly, I wondered whether an important African-American writer would find happiness at a school that was far from diversified in its makeup. We had very few black students, almost no black faculty members. So how could a woman who had traveled the world and become so widely known manage to live here in the South? What would attract her here? And she fell in love with Wake Forest. I would say a little unexpectedly. I remember one time I had to introduce her. Actually, it was in Washington, D.C., when she went up to get a medal from the president, the Medal of Freedom. The only person I think who had a connection with Wake Forest, except maybe Arnold Palmer, <laughs> who ever got that particular medal. And I had to introduce her, and I told her about how much we appreciated her being at Wake Forest. And she said, Wake Forest is my school. Very touching. One thing I especially liked about her, we had a lot of people coming to the campus who wanted to meet Maya Angelou. Maybe a basketball coach who had a top prospect that he wanted to bring to Wake Forest, and he had said, I really would like to meet Maya Angelou. And I would call Maya Angelou, and she would always say, of course. Or somebody writing a book about African-American women who wanted to meet her. And she would always say, sure. My favorite memory along those lines, 
I'm sure you all understand that Maya Angelou was a committed Democrat, <laughs> not a Republican. And she had been very active, as a matter of fact, in 1908 in supporting not Barack Obama, as you might guess, but Hillary Clinton. And she continued to love Hillary Clinton and Bill. Bill came to her funeral here. Some of you may know. Well, the young men and women in Wake Forest Young Democrat Club were getting ready to go to Charlotte for the convention in 2012. The Democrats held our convention in Charlotte last time. And about 30 or 40 of them were going down to the convention. And they said, we would really like to meet Maria Angelou and hear what she has to say about the convention. So I called Dr. Angelou and I said, would you meet with these 40 or 50 students? And she said, of course, bring them over. I took them over to her house over here off Coliseum Drive. She had prepared snacks and iced tea and had set a table for all the students. And she put them at the table and she talked with them. And then she said, I want to go around the room and I want every student to tell me who he or she is and why you want to go to the convention. What's in it for you? And what do you plan to do later in life? I want to hear each one of you. And so she sat back and one by one, every student talked about himself or herself. Well, that's, that's significant. That's significant. So they left happy. But what is even more significant was that after the convention, she called me and said, I want to see those students again. And I want them to tell me what they learned at the convention. So out of our way, with no particular requirement, we all went over there again. And again, we had tea and snacks. And again, every student spoke up and told her what he or she had learned. And that is a side of her that many people don't know. She was a diva. She was a big woman. She was proud, experienced, but she never lost the ability to look at individuals and say to them, make what you can of yourself. Who's got question seven? So through the years, Wake Forest has hosted many famous people. Uh, is there one person you have met or heard speak on campus who has made a memorable impression on you? Somebody who has spoken on campus. I have to go back to 1962 because that year I heard two of the great people of the 20th century, two, in one year, 1962. The first one, you may know, was Martin Luther King, who came to Wake Forest the same year that the Wake Forest trustees voted to integrate the university. And Martin Luther King gave a speech here, 
which turned out later to have been almost an echo of the great speech, I Have a Dream, that he made in Washington. And to meet Martin Luther King was a rare experience. And that's part of our recorded history. The other person I heard and met that year was Eleanor Roosevelt. She also was here that year. And by that time, she had helped to write the Declaration of Human Rights for the United Nations and had been acclaimed around the world as one of America's great women. And I still remember a student named Kelly Griffith, who was an English major, I'm pleased to say. <laughs> Kelly Griffith came out on the stage, no notes, and he came out on the stage and said, ladies and gentlemen, the first lady of the world And this huge audience just burst into applause and standing. But to be that close to Eleanor Roosevelt, who died later that year, actually, it was one of her last appearances, it was an unforgettable experience. And to hear her and Martin Luther King in one year. Did any of you listen to Pope Francis' speech on television this morning? He mentioned, I think, four people. Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, Dorothy Day, the Catholic social activist, and Thomas Merton. As somehow symbolic of what he wanted to say about the United States. He also said that the United States should always welcome foreigners because most of us are foreigners. Excuse me. Yeah, he's got the next one. Um, hello, Dr. Wilson. Um, I'm a freshman. So here's my question. Do you think Wake Forest students today receive a better education than you did? How has institutionalization of college changed the way students learn, live, and grow? Thank you. The first part was, do I think Wake Forest is what? Uh, receive a better education than you did, do you think? Yeah. I'm probably a prejudice here because I went to the old campus. I think that the quality of the Wake Forest education, if by the quality of the education, you mean the classroom experience, the faculty, the interweaving of students and faculty, and the places at which learning occurs. If that's what you mean by the quality of an education, I think the quality of education at Wake Forest was as good 50, 60, 70 years ago as it is now. And that's not detracting from the quality of education now. We have many more extras now. Students can go abroad. When I was a student, you considered it quite a lark if you went to Raleigh. <laughs> and if you went to Washington or New York, you were having one of the great experiences of your life. And students now can go to Venice or London or Vienna or Santiago or someplace quite regularly. And they have global experiences that were beyond our imagination. But those are extras. 
which we are fortunate in being able to provide. We also now have a diversity among our people so that people from different racial and ethnic backgrounds can work together and get to know each other. I went to an all-white school. So just as our minds and hearts are being enlarged by taking part in the world, so they're being enlarged by getting to know many, many people who in one way or another are not quite like ourselves. So there are all those extras that we have now. On the other hand, I might also point out that we did not have television and we did not have cell phone and we did not have some of the things that we have now that can so easily take us away from the purposes of a liberal arts education. So there are gains and there are losses. But I do want to say particularly to you young students that it is incorrect to suppose that at some magical point in our history we became so much better. It was the world that changed, not that Wake Forest changed. And you can go back and look at the class roles of the people who came here in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, and you can be happy to be their successors and their fellow alumni. I'm going to speak tomorrow night to the class of 1965, celebrating their 50th reunion. And I've got a list of the people who are coming. And to look at that list is to see some wonderful students who became wonderful alumni. There's a continuity in the Wake Forest story that is very special, I think. Are there any more questions that were pre-assigned in the audience? If not, I'm going to take moderator's liberty and ask one of my own. <laughs> so one of, one of the things I've seen since uh, um, and heard since I've been here is uh, at Wake Forest takes its motto, pro humanitate, very much, much more seriously than any other school that I've seen. So I'd really be curious to sort of hear your interpretation and how you feel that Wake Forest uh, uh. embodies its motto, pro humanitate. The uh, pro humanitate motto goes back to the administration of William Louis Petit, for whom Petit House is named. He was president from 1905, I think, until about 1929. He was a remarkable man in many ways. And let me digress long enough to say this. He was a very religious man. I would almost say from what I've heard, almost a kind of saintly man. And he was president of the Baptist State Convention, which was sometimes at war with Wake Forest. But during his presidency, the Scopes trial in Tennessee took place. This was a trial in which a man who had been teaching evolution in the Tennessee public schools was under fire. And William Jennings Bryan, a perennial candidate for president, had come to oppose the teaching of evolution. And Clarence Darrow was there on the other side. There was much excitement about the teaching of evolution. 
in, in the country generally. And members of the New York of the members of the North Carolina legislature introduced a bill to prohibit the teaching of evolution in North Carolina. And it was argued about all over the state. Who was the main defender of the cause of teaching evolution? It was President William Lewis Petit, a Baptist, a man of unquestioned piety. And he spoke out against what the people in Raleigh were trying to do to suppress academic freedom. And he won. And he won in part by going out to Wake Forest alumni in the legislature and persuading them that he was right. The important thing about that, and I feel like telling that story because I think it has contemporary overtones, is that that guaranteed academic freedom for Wake Forest. We have always practiced academic freedom. When I was a student, I read what I wanted to. When I was a teacher, I taught what I wanted to. And no one ever said no. Now, the other side of William Lewis Petit was that he felt that he wanted to have a motto for Wake Forest that meant something. And the ideal of pro humanitate was established. At that time, it meant mainly that Wake Forest Christians should go out into the world and preach the gospel for humanity. That's what it meant to start with. You should go and proclaim the good news of the gospel to people everywhere. As time has gone by, we have expanded that concept to say that Wake Forest students should go out into the world to teach, to preach, to serve, all in the cause of some human principle that is beyond themselves. And so it means something. I think we can take the motto and put it up on signs and say how nice it is. But what we really mean is that a Wake Forest person, in addition to learning, should also become an advocate for humanity in all of its various forms, wherever their search for truth might take them. So I think that's what it means, Tim. Thanks. We do have some time for questions from the audience. So does anyone have any questions for Dr. Wilson? Don't be shy. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yes, fine. Oh. Alex Reyes, I'm from the class of 2006. And um, I wanted to know, of the many ways that Wake, in which Wake Forest has changed over the years since you've been here, if you can pick one way in which it's changed that you feel has benefited the university and its students the most, what would you, what would you say that is? How has the change benefited Wake Forest the most? This is a throwback to something I've already said. I think it has changed the most in becoming, to a certain extent, a mirror and a reflection of the world as it is. On the old campus, we were isolated. We were all alike. You know, when I was a student, this seems hard to believe now. When I was a student, 85% of the students 
were North Carolina Baptists. Most of them from North Carolina. Because at that time, students didn't go far away to college, typically. When I was graduating from high school, it was going to be either Wake Forest or Chapel Hill, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I did not include Duke in my search. <laughs> and so we were, we were all sort of like each other. As a non-Baptist, I was in a minority. So we were happy, and we learned, and we, we, we became acquainted with the world. But the world was something out there. And now the world is here. And if you can't find the world on this campus, you don't have to go far to look for it. I think that's a big thing. And we're better off because of that. If you are going to send us out with a message today, pick a poem that you like and recite it to us. Oh. Now, that is a hard question. A poem to recite. Well, I guess I'll try to recite a poem by William Butler Yeats, an Irish poet whom I sometimes consider the best English language poet since Shakespeare. You can debate that. <laughs> it's a poem called The Song of Wandering Angus. Wandering Angus was a mythical character back in Irish legends. Do any of you know this poem? If anybody does, you might correct me. You know, it's hard to stand up here and be sure you've got it right. But he was a mythical character in Irish legend who always looked for the girl he hoped to love. So this is the poem, if I can remember it. I went out to the hazel wood because a fire was in my head and plucked a little cherry one and hooked a berry to a thread. And when white moths were on the wing and moth-like stars were flickering out, I dropped the berry in a stream and caught a little silver trout. When I had laid it on the floor, when I had laid it on the floor, it's hard to remember when you're standing up here, and went to blow, and went to blow the fire a flaming. Something rustled on the floor, and someone called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl with apple blossom in her hair who called me by my name and ran and faded through the brightening air. Though I am old with wandering through hollow lands and hilly lands, I will find out where she has gone and kiss her lips 
and touch her hand and walk among long dappled grass and pluck till time and times are done the silver apples of the moon the golden apples of the sun. C.S. Eliot once said that he did not think the mermaid would sing to him. If you happen to know the love song of J. Alfred Prusak, the mermaid sang to William Butler Yeats, and he pursued them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Except for that one slip, I think I got it right. <laughs> <laughs> of your time at Wake Forest, what's one funny story you would like to share? One funny story. Mm -hmm. Well, this may be more myth than fact, <laughs> but it is a story we told. And that is that on the old campus, you know, that was a purer time in some ways than now. Dancing was prohibited. You know that story. Dancing was not allowed at Wake Forest until 1968. Even on this campus, dancing was not permitted. There was some done illegally. But it was not allowed. On the old campus, we had a lot of magnolia trees. And the branches and the leaves of the magnolia trees went all the way down to the ground. Later on, when the seminary took over the campus, the lower leaves were cut off. But anyway, there are all these magnolia trees with all the way down here. One story we like to tell is that uh, one night, the night watchman on the campus was prowling around the campus just to make sure that everything was OK. And he went by one magnolia trees, and he heard some rustling down on the ground. And he looked down there. You can guess. There was a boy and a girl there on the ground under the magnolia tree. And he looked at them, and they looked up, and he said, oh, that's OK. I thought you might be dancing. <laughs> More, any, another, any other questions? Uh, it's hard to follow that one up. <laughs> <laughs> I think, Nobody else has another one. Can you share what you remember about the history of rolling the quad and what you know about how that started and, and developed? About rolling the quad. I can't tell you when that started. Ed, do you know? Or Doug? Ed Morris, by the way, is the director of the birthplace house in Old Wake Forest. I, I hate to take the stage away from Dr. Wilson. I said, I don't know the year, uh, but I have heard the story from people who participated in it. So it must have been maybe the early 50s, mm -hmm. late 40s, early 50s. Uh, we had beaten Duke in football, and uh, that was something that didn't normally happen. Um, and the tradition was that the festivities went on on the quad, and the students came into the administration bu uh, building all night and pulled the rope that rang the bell in the cupola. Um, and word came that the Duke students were on their way to Wake Forest to roll our trees with toilet paper. Uh, and there was a, a rush around the campuses. What were they going to do? And someone came up with the idea that when they get here, our trees will already be rolled. <laughs> so we rolled our own trees. The Duke <laughs> students came, and they just had to take their toilet paper and go home. <laughs> 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 
By the way, go down sometimes to Old Wake Forest to visit Ed and the house there. It's worth a visit. Yeah. Dean Wilson, I'm Walker Nolan of the class of 65. Oh, I know you Walker. <laughs> yeah. Good to see you. Uh, like many things of our in our class and myself, the story was just told uh, based on some facts, but uh, as you taught us in English class, uh, perhaps with, uh, with, with uh, a certain amount of uh, embellishment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I know it happened in 1962. Uh, we had beaten Duke also. Uh, that was the Bones McKinney era when we had uh, won the ACC championship, so it was rolled. Same thing, the rumor of all Duke was always coming. This also happened, <laughs> if you remember, at that time our center, All-American center, was named Lynn Chapel. Somebody uh, put... Uh, t took a big sign and put it over weight, so it became Lynn Chapel. So that was sort of the, <laughs> the, the start of that. And I would just like to comment uh, just more what you had, the advice you'd given to present students. Uh, some of us in 65 class have already gotten together a little bit over lunch and we're talking about obviously what this all meant to us. In a way, th a lot of, as you said, a lot of them have been extremely well accomplished people, but we looked back on it and said, you know, one of the things that really we took away from this, and particularly your classes, uh, that now maybe at this point in life we can say, was what we were taught or encouraged was the life of the mind, and that means being the present, that we could take with us always, no matter yeah. what we were doing or what we accomplished. Yeah. The accomplishments didn't count. It was like well, you said, we took what we learned here and what, what we were in, in friendships, and it lasted all along. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Walker. That is so true. Have time for one final question. Anyone have, else have a question they, they're dying to ask? Oh. I do. <laughs> <laughs> for good reasons, I think. Uh, <laughs> you are quite a universal man, I believe. And uh, I'm not sure a lot of people here realize how much involvement you've had in Wake Forest athletics over the years. Athletics as a means of uh, teaching also. Mm -hmm. But you. I'd like to hear your most favorite moment in the sports history of Wake Forest, college and university. Mm -hmm. Favorite moment in s sports history. It was a year in which our basketball team with Tim Duncan and Randolph Childress won the ACC tournament. The three games, one after another. And we sat there in the Greensboro Coliseum, just wrapped with what was happening. Doug might be able to tell me, what were the three teams we beat that year? Car Duke, Virginia, and Carolina on three nights. That's my favorite. <laughs> how, how can you do better than that? Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think one, frankly, if I may say so, one reason, it was also good, not only the victories, but the quality of humanity that Tim Duncan and Randolph Childress expressed in a world that sometimes is torn apart by misconduct. That meant a lot to me, too. There was also that great football victory over Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> what year was that? And Auburn, yeah, yeah. The first football game I ever saw, and this was in that old stadium before the big stadium on the old campus was built. The first football game I ever saw, we beat William Jewell. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think that gets us to our time. I'd like to invite you all. <laughs> Got, got too close to invite you all to thank Dr. Wilson. Uh, thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all of you, Judge. Thank you.